Hi, my name is Scott Onder with Mercy Corps. Uh, our website is mercycorps.org, M-E-R-C-Y-C-O-R-P-S dot O-R-G. Uh, you can get in touch with me on Twitter at scott.onder, O-N-D-E-R. Um, Thanks for joining us. Let's get uh, right to it. Can you elaborate on Mercy Corps' global strategy for impact investing and how it aligns with the organization's mission? Sure. So Mercy Corps Ventures is uh, the impact investing and innovative finance department of, of Mercy Corps, uh, which is a global NGO that operates across more than 40 countries around the world. Uh, we have a team about 6,000 people strong that's working hand in hand with people that are living through uh, crisis, poverty, and other uh, challenging situations. Our impact investing division uh, invests in a lot of the uh, solutions that are emerging uh, in technology ecosystems in Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia that are addressing a lot of the same global development challenges that Mercy Corps as an NGO is looking to address. Uh, we are a thesis-driven investor, uh, investing across uh, three different categories that develop climate and financial resilience for people that are living uh, at the base of the income pyramid. So we invest in climate smart technologies um, like data analytics and AI, uh, weather forecasting models, flood data analytics companies. Uh, we invest uh, across nature-based solutions and, and, and um, a uh, number of uh, renewable energy for productive use solutions. And then we also invest in financial inclusion and um, inclusive fintech solutions that help manage and transfer uh, climate-related risks. So things like embedded credit, uh, digital savings, insurance, things like that. And then we're also really interested in uh, developing uh, solutions for adaptive agriculture and food systems that help smallholder farmers and uh, the food systems that they operate in become more resilient. So uh, crypto and blockchain uh, underpins as a technology all three of those areas that we're investing in. Uh, we've invested in um, about 52 companies right now. Um, not all of them are, are crypto and blockchain enabled, but, but many of them are. Uh, they're currently operating across more than 80 countries, uh, 35 of the most climate vulnerable countries, uh, 25 of the least developed countries on the planet, and uh, currently impacting over over 25 million people uh, directly, which we're really pleased to see. Yeah, that's amazing. How does Mercy Corps approach its involvement in Web3 initiatives and partnerships with emerging technology ventures? Great. So Mercy Corps partners with emerging crypto and blockchain startups in three different ways. So first, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, invest at the pre-seed and seed stage in, in emerging tech startups that are using crypto and blockchain technologies. Um, we then support those companies for a few years afterwards, providing kind of custom technical support, helping them raise follow-on rounds of financing, help them with their go-to-market strategies, help them prove the impact and measure the impact of what they're doing. And then uh, we also uh, have a venture lab that uses philanthropic capital to pilot test alongside emerging startups uh, to test out and improve the impact of their products and services in emerging markets, especially for underserved users. And so every year we're launching eight to 10 different pilot projects. Uh, some of them uh, don't work and, and, and we pivot and go in a different direction. Some of them do work and we look to to scale them up. Uh, and so we'll bring in other funders, we'll bring in other partners to, to take those uh, now proven solutions to scale. And then the third way that Mercy Corps is really embracing crypto and blockchain is around incorporating into how the NGO operates, how we deliver uh, and operate uh, philanthropic uh, aid uh, to underserved vulnerable populations. We also incorporate it into some of our development programming. Uh, and we also look to incorporate it into some of our operations as well to increase the transparency, improve the efficiency and effectiveness of, of how we uh, operate and deliberate development work. What potential do you see for blockchain and cryptocurrency to address humanitarian challenges in traditional contexts? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so I, I think there's a number of different ways you can, that uh, crypto and blockchain can play an important role in humanitarian contexts. So first of all, we see that increasingly from a fundraising standpoint, um, 
awareness among uh, funders that providing crypto and blockchain donations um, when the need is greatest can really be highly impactful. Um, it's a way to trace your donation. It's a way to see the transparency of how that's being administered as well. Um, and then it's also a way that um, a lot of actors in the crypto and blockchain space can get behind certain issues. They can respond to help respond uh, to disaster for, and, and support vulnerable communities in that. Um, or they can, you know, play a role in, in helping kind of create the resources for uh, NGOs like Mercy Corps to respond. Um, I think secondly, like it can be used for delivering cash aid to, to people who need it the most that are in vulnerable situations. So um, in a number of uh, circumstances around the globe, whether it's conflict, natural disaster, climate shocks, there's an opportunity to deliver aid after a disaster happens to help people recover. Mercy Corps is also really excited about um, deploying some of that uh, philanthropy, some of that aid in an anticipatory fashion. So how might we deliver aid before a crisis occurs? So one example of that is something we just did in the Horn of Africa. Um, the Horn of Africa is experiencing its sixth consecutive drought right now. And it's really hitting farmers and pastoralists communities um, acutely. And the onset of a, a, another drought was detected um, earlier this year. And we deployed a, a pilot project where we had partners um, in a, a, a microfinance institution called Fortune Credit that's actually here at Consensus with us. Um, we had a, an Oracle partner, um, and then we also had a smart contract provider develop a solution where um, using satellite imagery data, it showed that there was a drought that was about to occur, and that triggered automated payments to pastoralist communities um, of that aid. And it's been shown that if you deliver that support before a crisis occurs, that um, people can um, weather the, the disaster more effectively and bounce back faster. Um, for every dollar invested, there's a six to one return on investment for, for doing that. So it's also a very efficient use of, of philanthropy as well. So those are just some of the ways that we're, we're using philanthropy in, in humanitarian context. But uh, we're also seeing that it, again, increases the transparency of how those dollars are delivered, um, increases the efficiency of it, so uh, lower cost. In this uh, example or on the Horn of Africa, um, best practice for delivering cash aid is it usually takes about seven days to deliver. We were able to deliver in less than 24 hours, and in fact, to many of the pastoralists in less than an hour. Um, the cost structure as well is more efficient, so best practice in delivering cash can, it can cost you know, anywhere between 10 and 15% to deliver that aid. Uh, in this pilot in the Horn of Africa, we were able to do so at a two to three percent cost structure, uh, so much more efficient with with, with donor capital. So that, that's the, those are some of the ways that we're really utilizing crypto and blockchain for humanitarian. That's great. Yeah. yeah. How do investors in economic development and life life programs complement emergency relief efforts? Yeah, great question. So yeah, so. Um, there's an arc uh, that we see as an organization uh, coming from uh, response to challenging situations, uh, to recovery, to helping communities over time build resilience. And um, certainly as an organization, we are there to help respond to, to crisis. Um, but, and then we work with communities through that recovery period. And in many instances, we're there for the long run for sometimes a decade or more to help those communities build more resilient approaches to, to development. And um, this can take a lot of different forms. With rural communities, it's often supporting uh, smallholder farmer livelihoods uh, and the kind of agriculture value chains that they operate in. Uh, with urban or peri-urban communities, we're doing a lot of work around supporting micro and small businesses, providing access to financing and capital, providing um, job opportunities for young people. Um, so we see those as very complementary to humanitarian response. And in fact, I'd say in almost all the markets that Mercy Corps works, we may enter um, because of a crisis or a disaster, uh, but we, we often stay through uh, years ahead to help through that kind of recovery and, and resilience building uh, for economic development. How do you envision the role of impact investing and innovative finance in shaping the future of humanitarian aid and development efforts? Yeah, so I, 
we see an opportunity uh, for more NGOs to incorporate impact investing and innovative finance into how they operate. Um, it brings in different types of capital to uh, address a lot of the same challenges NGOs are already working on. And then it also can catalyze um, more private sector capital. So more uh, capital from the uh, uh, private markets, from capital markets. And the way that we're seeing that already happen uh, as, an ex as a tangible example with Mercy Corps Ventures, we've invested uh, $10 million out of uh, our first fund directly into to ventures. And that's catalyzed an additional $463 million in uh, investment into those same solutions. So impact investment when deployed uh, strategically can really help uh, prove out and de-risk uh, some of these unproven solutions uh, that then can crowd in more investment from the private sector in ways that can scale up those, those solutions once they've been proven. Um, I think also for, in terms of innovative finance, there's a revolving aspect to that capital as well. So, and a sustainability structure that a lot of purely grant-based programming doesn't get to achieve. So if you're able to incorporate um, kind of sustainable models into uh, the, uh, the projects themselves, they can uh, last longer, they can get, go on into perpetuity uh, and have a sustainability aspect to them. And then also in terms of philanthropy, uh, the, the the capital then can be revolved over time and create more impact. And so we're doing that uh, with one of our venture funds as well. We're actually able to revolve any of the investment returns back into making more impactful investments. That's great. Next set of questions is going to be a little more general, um, but you can tie it back to most people have been. Can you share your perspective on most significant developments in a blockchain space over the past year and a half? Sure. Um, so we see crypto and blockchain is democratizing access to capital, but also to innovation for emerging market entrepreneurs. Um, a lot of the walled gardens of, of Web2 uh, can actually marginalize and exclude uh, innovators in emerging markets that don't have access to uh, the centralized companies, whether they're tech companies or financial institutions that hold the, the keys to who has access to build on top of their platforms or not. Um, crypto and blockchain, these are public blockchains that anybody can build on top of. They're composable in that any application can uh, be built on top of the, the, the software and, and the protocols. Uh, and they're permissionless. And so we see just generally uh, a more dem democratized access to, to being able to innovate uh, and to be an entrepreneur. Um, in the last year, we've seen a lot of the public blockchains develop lower cost uh, opportunities for uh, uh, for entrepreneurs to build on top of. So the layer two ecosystem in, in Ethereum uh, is making it possible to have lower cost transactions for emerging market users that creates more affordable access to financial services and other services. Um, uh, integrated blockchains like Solana and in the move ecosystem are also creating that low cost, high speed um, opportunity for a whole new generation of, uh, the, of solutions to be built on top of that. So solutions like micropayments, solutions like uh, on-chain credit or savings accounts, those are all now accessible. And then, you know, certainly I think the um, adoption of, of stable coins and the proliferation of, of stable coins uh, usually pegged to the US dollar, have been a lifeline for communities that are living in hyperinflationary environments. So to be able to not only uh, utilize uh, stable coins for payments, but to be able to hold them in a, a savings account. And, and now increasingly uh, over the last year, we've seen a, a variety of uh, yield generating savings products emerging. Um, that, that can be uh, tremendously important for, for households and small businesses that are looking to be uh, more resilient and have more of a stable um, uh, kind of financial position. One example, in our portfolio, uh, an uh, entrepreneur that's actually here with us at Consensus, uh, Nelly Chachua Diop, uh, who's the founder and CEO of Ijara. It's based out of Cameroon in West Africa. And she uh, and Mercy Corps Ventures worked with the Central Bank of Cameroon to develop 
a tokenized uh, bond that was also fractionalized and creating a savings product for her users that um, for as little as the equivalent of a dollar and fifty cents could um, purchase a fractionalized share of a tokenized government bond that would then be uh, yielding a, an interest uh, rate for them as, as savers. So just an example of like how in, this is would probably have only been possible in the last year to have a real world asset tokenized on chain, a portable at that level, uh, the transaction fees being nominal. Uh, and, and those are some areas we're really excited about. So very exciting indeed. How do you see the role of traditional finance institutions evolving with the rise of decentralized finance and blockchain technologies? I think, yeah, I think uh, traditional financial institutions would be smart to transform their platforms into more open, accessible platforms uh, that they essentially can decentralize access to. So, um, a lot of the multinational financial institutions um, that offer banking services, um, that offer services to households, to individuals, as well as the small businesses, to be able to um, empower their clients to be able to um, self-custody their own assets, uh, to be able to transact, to have basic ban banking services like credit and insurance, uh, and to be able to do so in a way that's competitive, so that that users can shop around for the best, the best prices, the best the, uh, the best products that, that fit their lifestyle. Um, I think we're going to see a whole new era of of how financial institutions compete with one another, rather than um, doing it through, you know, um, regulatory capture or uh, you know entrenched positions within markets. I think there's going to be more of an open marketplace uh, for, for consumers and businesses to kind of select. And, and the, the winners of that are going to be the ones that realize they need to open source their, their platforms uh, globally and, and operate in that kind of decentralized manner. So. so what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the adoption of blockchain technology? How can the industry overcome them? So thinking through the lens of like an emerging market user that wants to access financial services to improve their livelihood. Um, some of the biggest challenges to adoption are really related to how we move from the current phase that we're in to the, the new era where blockchains will underpin all of our digital lives, all of our financial experiences. So the, the way that that's manifesting itself right now is you know, on and off ramping. So how do you take your fiat currency and put that on, digitize that and put that onto a blockchain. But even more difficultly, how do you, when you receive a payment from somebody, how do you off ramp that into, into cap up, into cash? There just aren't many on and off ramps in most of the emerging markets where we're operating. Um, and where they do exist, um, there might be, uh, other hurdles for users to be able to access them. Um, there's a billion people on the planet that lack access to a government issued ID. Uh, most of, uh, that is disproportionately women. Um, and so people are going to be excluded from being able to participate in um, the global Web3 economy um, in, in a lot of those arenas. Um, we're also seeing the, the um, acceptance of, of crypto among merchants is really limited. So that kind of limits the, the usefulness of being able to access uh, products like stable coins. So we need to essentially see a, a vibrant, um, uh, ecosystem of merchants that are willing to accept and transact uh, using crypto. And then thirdly, like we need to see greater uh, connectivity and access to energy, access to electricity. Uh, that's happening quickly right now. So the cost of smartphones and the cost of mobile internet is coming down precipitously, uh, but it's still not there for everybody yet. Um, but over, over the next five years, we're, uh, we're optimistic that, that everybody will be able to afford access to to, to mobile internet. How do you envision a future of Web3 and what impact do you think it will have on the internet as we know it? So, um, my personal opinion is that blockchains will underpin our, our digital lives. So, I, th I think every um, digital platform will have a back end that it involves uh, blockchains, um, 
either for data management uh, or for managing assets and financial services. Um, I think that might create opportunities that could empower users of, of digital networks. Um, if you have the opportunity to own your own data and control who has access to it, where where you port that data, where you don't share that data, I think that could be uh, tr transformative for, for users of social networks, e-commerce networks, uh, financial service networks. Um, I think the other area that, that's super interesting is around um, uh, climate action. So I think we're seeing that increasingly there's opportunities around carbon credit markets uh, to bring those on chain to tokenize carbon credits. Um, and for a range of different actors from, from corporates to governments to individuals to be able to um, really be incentivized uh, to coordinate around the, addressing the climate crisis. And so that's another area where I think blockchains are going to play a key role in, in kind of digitizing access to carbon credit markets and, and, and climate action. So very interesting. What advice would you give to new entrepreneurs entering the blockchain and crypto space today? Yeah. Um, so in emerging markets, we're, we're seeing uh, a lot of young people kind of entering the, the crypto and blockchain space. Um, I would say that I trying to get to a point where you have a cheap product market fit before you have necessarily a token strategy can be a wise thing to do uh, to really figure out what the value proposition of your product or service is for your users, for your clients, um, before you think about how you're necessarily monetizing your network. Um, certainly before you're kind of distributing a token uh, can be important. Uh, we see a number of startups kind of skip some of those important fundamental steps. Um, and while that might create like short-term liquidity, it doesn't necessarily um, set companies up to be long-term successful or, or impactful. So th that's one piece of advice is really focus on like, are you solving a real problem for real users? Um, and are you doing it in a way that could be sustainable long term? And then kind of figure out the tokenomics uh, along the way uh, rather than prior to that. That would be probably, yeah, one, one piece of advice. And now to include the interview, um, is there anything that uh, you would have liked me to ask that I didn't ask that you want to share? Uh, well, if you're interested, we could tell you a bit more about um, one of the pilots we did with, with Atlantis Dow. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Let's hear it. Well, uh, Ertu, do you want to take it away? Introduce yourself. And, uh... Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Ritu, and uh, I'm the co-founder of Atlantis. Uh, uh, we were fortunate to have, do a pilot with Mercy Corp, and uh, the objective of the pilot was to build a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer water network. And uh, it was set in India, uh, in a remote uh, northern part of Karnataka, and it was 50 villages. Uh, they have been having constant droughts and landslides, a uh, lot of water-related challenges. And uh, we did a pilot where we tried to build a coordination mechanism that could look at uh, not just maintaining uh, the quality of water, but figuring out where are the access points, where could you harvest excess water, and the final stretch was like, is it possible to even capture excess resource and exchange it within this peer-to-peer -peer network? Uh, it was close to 15 months of an experiment. We had uh, 3,000 people contribute towards it. Uh, by the end of it, some of the key highlights, uh, we were able to uh, harvest almost 210 kiloliters of water. And we had more than 150 harvests contribute to this network. And once they harvested, naturally there was excess water. And now people could actually buy it from the marketplace. So there were a bunch of people harvesting the rainwater. There were a bunch of people actually using the network to access this extra water. That's bad. And, yeah, and since it was completely community-led, there were also other green jobs that cropped up. Like, hey, are these validate these harvesters maintaining the system properly, uh, doing random checks on the quality of the water. So this gave new earning opportunity for the villagers. Uh, they, they never knew that they could earn from doing a water survey on their phone and get some coins. Uh, naturally, in this pilot, there were a few things that we learned. Like Scott touched upon, like one is that like the whole off-ramping, figuring out uh, how can you 
get more use cases for a token, especially because you need a vendor ecosystem as well. So these were some insights, uh, but I think for us the biggest win was uh, knowing that you could use smart contracts, build this coordination mechanism, and it doesn't have to be very tech savvy because even people in rural India could figure it out. It's all about well-designed UX. You hide the blockchain layer. Uh, not everyone needs to know that. Uh, but the people who are putting the fund, they really need to know like where exactly did the money go? Where did the last mile delivery of that dollar go? So uh, it was very, uh, it was a crossroad for us as a company as well. We really wanted to do this. We had a lot of belief in this thesis because we've been doing it previously for three years before we went to Masukov. And uh, they had an appetite to actually like take on the challenge, which was uh, very unique for us. I remember having like, I think seven, eight meetings with the team and like, we were like, are they getting what we're trying to do? Uh, so hats off to that, like it was an amazing pilot for us as well. Uh, also I had a lot of people believe the thesis, you know, like we could actually use blockchain for like just coordination. And right? so, yeah, uh, a lot of exciting things to look forward to. That sounds very exciting. And if I wanted to contribute today, uh, where can I um, get my hands on? So we, just two days back, we finally got our app. It's launched in App Store and uh, Play Store. So we have something called Impact Miner. You just download the app, you create a profile, and then you can start contributing to the network in different kind of bounties, all of them focusing on climate. Uh, we started the experiment in water first, but over time we are transitioning from water, energy, all kind of climate action related stuff. So it's in some ways like you're uh, incentivizing communities to build this co-op. Sounds fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Welcome. <laughs>